Hi, I'm Lenora. I'm Kristen. Hello. I'm Isabel. Hola. Hi, I'm Kristen Tetsi, author of The Age of the Child, in which Catherine and Graham have a plan for their life together, which is no children. When Graham changes the plan after the fall of Roe versus Wade, he alters not only their future, but the future of their country. Yeah. Hi, I'm Isabel. I am the founder and firebrand of The Uprising Spark. I am a coach for child-free people. I also organize trips for child-free people around the world, and I am the host of the Honest Soap Opera podcast. Hi, my name is Lenora Fay. I'm a child-free lifestyle advocate and one of the co-founders of Child Free Media, which is a network leading the conversation for those interested in the child-free lifestyle. We were the proud presenter of the 2022 virtual child-free convention earlier this year, which you can now watch the replays up over on Child Free Media YouTube channel and soon to be Child Free Media podcast. And we are the three founding nodmothers of Child Free Girls. In this episode, our guests today are internationally known expert Laura Carroll, who is also the founder of International Child Free Day. And we have the winners of this year's International Child Free Group of the Year and International Child Free Person of the Year. So welcome, Laura, Bettina, and <laughs> Veronica. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just like, looking so at Child Free Connection. <laughs> and and, and um, honorable mention, Rick, yes. who is currently yes. not here, but is here yes. in spirit. <laughs> Not always. that he's gone, not that he's gone, but you know, he's here. <laughs> he's always lurking. He's okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, um, so we're going to kick things off with Laura. Uh, Laura, since establishing International Child Free Day in 2013, kind of as a reboot, how has its recognition grown over the years? Oh, gosh, with each year, you know, and more and more people learn about it, we get more and more nominations from different countries, and really it it's expanded mostly through people who who spread the word online and also having great selection panels uh, also helps because they have to do great outreach all over the world. So e each year it gets better and better. And I've, I've had over since 2013, some great volunteers who kick some major butt, you know, online, just trying to get the word out there. So and then all throughout the year, we continue to post about child free lives and winners and what's what's happening in previous winners lives and whatnot. So we, we keep at it all year long. How many nominations did you receive this year? Do you remember off the top of your head? Hmm. Well, I know we've got, uh, it was a special year because we got four nominations for the Child Free Connection. <laughs> so that made the panel go, hmm, there's something going on there. So, <laughs> uh, so that was a little unusual. We have gotten repeat nominations over the years. But, uh, you know, I think in the like 2013, maybe we got eight or nine and then the most we've ever gotten is well over 20 so you know it's it's all over what i like to see is what's the global uh what countries you know the amount of countries across the world do these nominations come from that's to me where i see uh, more of the impact and part of this challenge is to get people all over the world to think that they can do a nomination and I get, you know, during the nomination process, I get, you know, texts and direct messages from people saying, well, I really want to nominate somebody, but I don't feel like I can really write the right things. Like, you know, you can. So part of it is to, you know, encourage people that they can do it. And, uh, and that, you know, they're more often than not excellent nominations to have to uh, pick from. So there's and that. then how do you choose how does the panel choose who ends up um, winning? Is it based on number of nominations? Is it based, do you have a sort of um, rubric, I guess, or? Boy, it's an organic process every year. The, the panels are often different and the nominations are obviously always quite different. So we first, one of the constants uh, we look at is how well do they answer the nomination questions? Um, pretty basic. And do they, do they keep it around 500 words or do they come in at, you know, 12,000 or something? <laughs> So I have to email people back going, uh, you might want to cut that down. So some, some parameters are, uh, we try to set them, but more often than not, just looking at the, the quality of the work, the quality of the person's life. It's not just people who are doing kick-ass things, child-free research or whatever. It's like, who are the people that are really walking the talk of a really good, fulfilling child-free life and what that can look like. And as we all know, it can look a lot of different ways. So that's part of an aspect we look at as well every year. I feel like the person who would submit like a 12,000 word nomination <laughs> would be Kristen. <laughs> Like she would go into like the most intimate details and be like, all right, can you try this again? And <laughs> another thing. 
I got a, I've gotten a, we've got the panels got a few over the years where they they're PDFs and they come with images. It, it's like a wow, it's wow. like a, a corporate presentation, you know. <laughs> but but I think we've been post that. <laughs> I think we've been set up though to do that because you know like yeah. we're always competing. Yeah. You know like like not not in the I'm not talking about the child free space specifically, but you know just in life like we are like you have to be the best, you have to show up and give it your all, and so. Yeah. You know, when you're talking nominations, the first thing we're like, we're going to like Nobel Peace Prize mode, you know, <laughs> like we have to, we have to be so in depth and no stone unturned, no story un really? unsaid in order to make it seem like this person's amazing, which I can see why it's daunting to nominate because you're like, well, they're just cool. Like, what else can I say about it? And that's yeah. kind of all you want to say. But, you know, it's, I, I think it's, that's our mindset nowadays because we are, we've been kind of forced to really present ourselves on a basis of competition but really it's you know in this particular situation it's not a competition right. you know we're all we're all working on the same goal so right. you know it's it's good to highlight that you know to nominate someone you don't have to <laughs> present a thesis well one reason we like to keep it simple is because for people that are sending in nominations where english is not their first language you know there are mm -hmm. some where mm -hmm. uh you know it's it's tougher to try to articulate what they're really trying to say so sometimes that just means working with them to help the translations, et cetera. So there's there's a reason why we keep that like presentation visual bar at a really kind of a normal, simple level because things come in from all over the world. And uh, also it's trying to express one reason why we want people to be acquainted with or or know the person they're nominating is because we can we can sense that even if it comes in a you know uh, from someone whose English is not that great we we help you know uh, make that nomination read as, as well as possible but if we can we can feel like what they're saying about who they're nominating that's uh, really important too. Speaking of who's been nominated, what if we allow Bettina and Veronica to introduce themselves? Yeah. Are, 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 are you saying Tina, my moderating skills need work here? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was saying I was saying that the more brains you have, the better they work together. Yeah. We all we all need a little touching up here. Let's go alphabetically um, and start with well alphabetically with the first name and start with Bettina if that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> well, hello everyone. Uh, sorry, sorry for my accent because I I didn't speak uh, a lot uh, lately about the chat free lifestyle in English because I'm more used to speaking French so sorry about the it's accent. It's okay we have Isabel it's fine we're, we're all good we're good with accents here. <laughs> um, so yeah I, I'm French uh, I'm 30 years old and um, I am having an Instagram account called Je ne veux pas d'enfants which means I don't want kids in French and I started this account three years ago because I just realized that this is not something that we speak a lot about in France or in French-speaking countries let's say. Um, this is um, it, it's funny what you said, Laura, uh, at the beginning, because um, it, when I start, when I spoke about the International Chat Free Day, most of the people in France don't know about this this day. Actually, they don't even know this exists. They don't they don't know about the website that you have or anything. So I spoke a lot about it, and I think it's great to be able to like build bridges between different countries and languages. So I'm very happy to be here with you. And uh, yeah, what else? I I wrote an essay about not wanting children uh, three years ago and about the reasons that can lead to a choice of being child-free or non-choice, because it can also not be a choice. Um, and also I write a lot about what people uh, tell us when you say you don't want a child, especially when you're women. <laughs> uh, and yeah, and most generally I speak a lot about um, feminism, uh, about ecology, about uh, capitalism, about many topics that are kind of related to uh, wanting or not children and about the fact that our bodies don't really, um, are not something that we really own, especially when we have a uterus inside. <laughs> that's, that's all. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Veronica. I'm 46 years old, a child-free woman, and I live in Austin, Texas with my partner, Rick. Uh, I'm actually a New York City girl at heart, grew up in New York City, and really squeezed the juice out of that city and decided to slow things down because I definitely extended my party years way after they should have ended. And uh, we moved to Austin, Texas. Um, and uh, uh, what really started this process for us was uh, during the pandemic, um, I was hearing so much about uh, remote, remote learning. Actually, one of my clients uh, was a school at the time. And, and it was so much focus on the struggle that parents were going through. And I was hearing it from my friends, from family members, 
But I remember reading an article, and I think it was in the New York Times, where they started talking about how child-free people were um, expected to pick up the slack for parents because parents were having such a hard time with it. And that article, like, really didn't sit right with me because I completely understood that parents needed help and I felt so bad and I would help parents at any time in need and I understand that they were overloaded. So that it, the help wasn't the issue. The issue for me was the expectation that child-free people are just sitting around with their feet up. So of course they need to help the parents out, you know, not to, not taking into consideration that they could be caretaking, that they themselves could be going through um you know, physical issues, mental issues, and a slew of caretaking and elderly parent, um, it, it it just became, it just like really rattled my mind. And that took me through to a very deep hole of researching child-free because I was very naive at the time. And I thought, oh, all these things that I went through must not be still, must not be happening still at this point in time because we all accept one another and accept one another's choices and it's not an issue. And I quickly found out that that was not the case. So I just talked to Rick and I said, I think that I really want to get involved in this conversation. And you and I have a very different journey towards being child free. And we feel that um, by starting the child free connection, we could really add a voice to the space. So our mission was to, or intention rather, was to create uh, create a global book, global community, of course, but really to shine a light on the child-free path and to help people through the many, many, many challenges that can arise when you, to, when you make this choice. Um, Bettina, I wanted to ask you, um, I've seen your work. I, I love what you do. Um, I've seen it for a long time. Actually, I think you were one of the first accounts of the child-free accounts that I saw when I first started as well in this space. I lived in France for four years. And one of the things that I remember the most about living there was how misogynistic society, like French society is just in general. Like you get, I got sexually harassed more times walking down the street in France than I've ever done in Colombia in my whole life. Mm -mm -mm. And so I just wanted to ask you how has been the response because you're talking about subjects that are very feminist, you know, centered on women's rights, our right to choose. So I wanted to ask you how the response has been from your French audience. Yeah, it's it's really interesting that you're pointing this because, you know, as a woman, um, actually, I'm, I'm a huge traveler and I've been living uh, in Guatemala, I've been living in Cambodia, Thailand for a few years uh, because I really want to discover the whole world. <laughs> and um, most of the time, French people and many men um, telling me, oh, my God, this, this is so dangerous for you to go live there alone. And are you not, aren't you scared about being harassed or anything? And this is quite uh, interesting because right now I'm in Montreal for since two months, and here it's like it doesn't exist actually. <laughs> like uh, being Canada. The <laughs> I'm in Western Canada. I'm in Alberta, so welcome. <laughs> is it is it the same in Western oh, yeah. Canada? I, I'm wow. a solo traveler. I I live alone. I do everything by myself, and no, it's 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 nice. I mean, it's not perfect, yeah. but of course. it's it's a you know. And I'm not a world traveler, but yeah, I feel safe here. I live in a big city on the prairies. I you know. I, I feel it's safe. so different yeah in mm -hmm. here in in Quebec it's like wow I, I've never seen that and actually yeah France is not really a safe uh, this is quite a, a country where um, the mis misogyny and sexism is really uh, something that we don't speak of you know there is this um, I don't know the name in English but there is a lot of cultural things about love like French love and oh, p oh men are supposed to be like gallant or something like that but actually, many men just um, are not. <laughs> They're just very sexist. And they, they think this is how it's, we are supposed to uh, to behave with women. And this is really not the case. And uh, yeah, when I speak um, on my social media about uh, like not the right to choose and um, the fact that I don't want children because I just never felt like I'm interested in being a mother. Uh, and then I just add a lot of uh, political uh, reflection and ideas to that. Uh, on my social media, it's going quite okay. I think 90% of the commentaries and the, the comments and uh, the DM I receive are really positive uh, because they come from women that really just wanted a place to discuss with the other people that can understand them. Uh, but when I do receive message from men, this is another thing. <laughs> it's really different. And, um, and I do re realize that because uh, last week I got an interview published on a, a very general uh, med French media. And so it, it's not something really feminist, but it's just um, like showing different person and different type uh, of way of living. And I just read the comments. They are like 
thousands of comments of people just insulting me and uh, really uh, saying that I have mm. a mental problem, that uh, I am doing some propaganda uh, towards women, that I should, I, I don't have them in mind, all of them, but it's really, really deep. And uh, yeah, I think it's quite important to spread the message outside of the our own communities, because of course we are like nice together because we have the same ideas. But when I do spread the, uh, this kind of uh, message outside, I do realize there is a lot to do still and that, um the the idea of not wanting children uh, it's not something that is really well accepted in france because we don't we are very pro natalist country and for the moment this is not something we do speak a lot about and i hope we will uh, speak a bit more of it and make people understand that it's not um it's just a personal choice but it can have a, like a political and uh, and uh, public uh, implication because this is something we need to speak about at a governmental or like public level, I would say. But yeah, there is a lot to do still. <laughs> I'm looking at the reactions of all of you as you were speaking. I'm like, we are all ready to go into battle with you right now, this very second. So let's go. <laughs> but 100%, 100%. Right? Like I was looking at Veronica, I'm like, oh, she's ready to fight. <laughs> she is ready to fight. I mean, once again, Hollywood has lied to us about French. <laughs> Everything. It's, it's like, really I mean, the stereotype, I think maybe that was the word. I remember hearing that the stereotype of, you know, the French lover who's like really mm -hmm. gentle and no, that that. <laughs> No, Not, the problem matter. is that, for example, mo many, many persons in France, many men don't know about the, cons the, the word consent. It's like, oh, because, you know, and wow. we can like uh, touch a lady without its consent because it's like being uh, a real French man. You know, you can like even in the movies, it's something like kissing a girl without her consent. This is something that we show everywhere not only in French movies, because also in like US movies or anything, but this is something that we don't, uh, there is no like a public discussion about that in France, not, not for the moment. And every time there is an accusation of a man about rape or sexual harassment or anything, the first uh, reaction that you can see massively online is like, we are not like that. And now we will have to write a consent form or go to a judge if you want to have sex with someone and stuff like that. So it, this is really getting crazy right now, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, and Veronica, you're in Texas, which is also very conservative. I mean, you come from New York, which is super mm -hmm. liberal, and you went yes. to Texas, which is like the uh, the opposite. Right, right. Culturally. culturally. Mm -hmm. So has, how has it been for you and Rick uh, with the Chocolate Connection, the reactions, especially specifically from Texans, but of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, actually, Austin is not the Texas that you would consider as far as its political views. It's actually... Um, quite the opposite of what you would imagine. However, um, if you drive about 35 minutes, 40, 45 minutes out of Austin, you start to see the change in people's perceptions, people's thinkings, people's mind frames rather quickly. Um, I actually really like being here. Like some of my friends from New York, like, how can you possibly live there? I actually have the belief that it's important for people to infiltrate societies that are really um uh, one-sided or single-minded because that's really the only way that change can really happen, right? If we start having these conversations with people who have different views than us, because you met someone at the pool or at the bar or at the library, wherever, it really starts to open up conversations. And I really find that people are open to conversations and that a lot of the conflict is what we see in media and how, how those conversations are portrayed. But my personal experience has been um, that I've had really open and good conversations where like, okay, this is how I think, and this is my side. And what do you think? And maybe they don't align, but at least we can express it without any conflict. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's nice to fun. hear actually. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <it's refreshing. laughs> yeah. Again, and I'm talking specifically about Austin and, and the, and the surrounding areas that has been my personal experience. And we have so many transplants. Austin is, you know, I think there's like 500 people moving here a day. It's been insane. Um, so we have, you know, New York transplants, LA transplants, Miami. Uh, so I think it's definitely even changing the vibe of the city even more to have a lot of, to have the opportunity to have these conversations. And hopefully that will start affecting like the powers that be that I, I'm not, I'm again, Canadian, we have a different political system, but from what I, I learn a lot from Americans, yeah. Uh, hopefully that will start to influence what needs to be influenced to open people back up again to the fact that, you know, there's more than one way to live. Or right, right. Absolutely. And by physically being here, all the people whose belief systems do not align with the government, we can actually take action and do something. Right, so yeah. I find that really rewarding as well.
You know, I'm interested in the, um, I'm, I'm kind of, I know that misogyny and expecting women to have kids kind of go together. Um, but in thinking about the way women are portrayed, at least, um, and maybe I'm thinking of movies <laughs> or even the books, like there are books by French women about how to raise their kids. And there's a very um, hands-off sort of approach that, you know, my kids aren't my entire life. I, I have my life. I pay attention to my kids, but they're not like, I'm not. I'm not lording over them all the time, which makes French speaking or French women seem very independent and very um, reasonable and strong headed. Um, and I hate saying that because no one calls men strong headed or strong minded, but that's as it is. Um, so I wondered, I understand now that men are very grabby and think they're entitled to such things, but how are the women when it comes to the expectation that they'll have kids and is there a huge expectation that they will have kids and how do they do they also kind of back down about that because the pressure is so great um yeah actually this is a good point as well because i was talking uh, previously about men but the reaction the negative reaction when you say you don't want kids at least here in france that's why it's, it's interesting to speak about like from different countries as well um, is also very strong from women because the um, of course if we live in a I live in a quite misogynist country and of course the patriarchy has come to our minds even if you are uh, if you were um, grown as a girl of course and even more I think because we have other expectations and I think this is something common to other countries but we are raised uh, as future moms it's not something that is which is a if uh, you will have children but it's really when you will have children still now. Um, that's why I'm also a lot talking about the gender stereotypes and how we should maybe um, have a critical uh, thinking about how we raise uh, children and uh, about their sexuality, about the norms that we just put on them, even when they are like one or two years old. This is something crazy. <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, for um, on my Instagram account, I do receive a lot of messages from people uh, from women who don't understand um, why I don't want children, but they are doing it. Uh, okay, sometimes I get insulted, of course, but mostly they just want to understand because they don't. They just simply don't because they never met someone who was thinking about not wanting children. Um, and I also have a lot of people who, of child-free women uh, who are just thanking me, or not me especially, but thanking the fact that there are some uh, places like this Instagram account to speak with other people uh, like them, uh, because uh, just they, they are in big, big conflict with their own families about not wanting children. Uh, and I also received not, not a lot of messages like that, but some, and I was really shocked about it, about women who did have children and regret them because they just had these children, these children, sorry, because of the social pressure they experienced in their own families, uh, like parents who were telling them that they will not be complete uh, if they don't have their own children, or making them guilty about the fact that they don't have grandchildren for now, and that it's really time to go with the family and, and to have your own babies and stuff. So yeah, this is something that, um, that's, that's also why I'm, I'm really willing to speak a lot about it on a bigger scale because I don't want to push anyone not to have children. I, I just want that everybody can have the opportunity to think about this at a moment in life. For example, here in Montreal, I am living at someone's place, which is back to France for its holiday. And um, this uh, woman has a child, uh, but she lent me a book, which is called Nullipar. So it's the French word for women who never uh, got a baby. And she told me, I bought this, uh, this book like, two or three years ago, because I just wanted to read to read um, a lot of testimonies about women who had children, women who didn't have children, so I can make my own choice. And I, I was really pleased to hear that, because I think it's really important to have, a, to have this moment for yourself without the pressure of your family, friends, uh, employer, or anything anyone else, and to really decide if you want to have a children or not, because um, for the moment, many people still don't have this opportunity to know that it's possible not to have children, actually. <laughs> so, yeah, I would say that about friends, but I don't know how it is in other countries, so I would be glad um, to hear. <laughs> I can actually chime in. So I was born in Argentina, and I lived in a home where my dad clearly was the boss, you know, and um, we really had to focus on um, generally, I feel like I, I, I was taught that to some extent women were less than right because they were there to cook and clean, even though my mom 
had two jobs. She still did the cooking and the cleaning and the, you know, and then when she wasn't available, obviously me and my sister would do it because God forbid my dad would do it. But um, so I was very much, I grew up in a very traditional Hispanic culture where that was just the way it was. I have about, I, I once we moved to the United States, we didn't stay in touch with my family. At least I did it. And I probably have about 50 cousins. They all have children. I'm the only one that took this path. And um, I haven't gone back to this in a long time, but I really want to go soon. And I really want to talk to them about were they aware that there was a choice not to? Is this something that was really ingrained with them to be a mom? Do they know other people who don't have kids? And I just want to see if there has been any cultural shifts ha since I've been there. Yeah. Argentina is also one of the most misogynistic countries in the region. By the way. I mean, I yeah, I I I, I have a clear memory of me being maybe seven or eight years old and just seeing the dynamic of my mother and my father and how he treated us. I have a sister and just being very clear that that was not for me um, and that uh, women's issues were going to be at the forefront of anything that I did at any time. Um, actually, a little fun fact, when I was in sixth grade, I, I, I went into this oratorical contest and I did Susan B. Anthony's speech on women's rights and I won the whole thing. And it was like definitely what got me to, okay, there is something I need to do with this. I'm not sure what it is, but it's something I need to do with this because it's really important to me. It always yeah. takes just one tiny little moment. Mm -hmm. And the thing is like, it's, it's amazing because, you know, when you're talking with people, especially those of us who like, we're all different, but we bonded in the fact that we're kind of weirdos in the sense that we knew that there was something, but we didn't know what, but it's always that one little thing. And it's, it generally starts young and then it gets buried by everything else we're dealing with, whether it's religion or culture or, you know, where you live. Mm -hmm. And, but then when you, when you like listening, I'm like, that was me. Like, that was my experience. Like growing up in a cult in Northern Alberta, like I knew there was something, didn't know what. Mm -hmm. And it's only recently revealed itself at like, like I'm turning 40 this year, but like a, like a few years ago, it only started to reveal itself truly. So it takes a while, but I, I, I bring, I just to sh shine a light on this for anyone listening or watching, like whatever age you are, if you, if you feel that, you know what we're talking about and you've buried it, let it out <laughs> because it will take you somewhere and you don't have to know what it is because it takes like, I think all of us, you know, it, it takes a while for, we have a voice, but it takes a while for us to find it and then to know what to do with it. Right. So it's just really cool to acknowledge again to anyone, whatever gender, wherever you are, like if you feel something, don't ignore it because that's what's going to lead you to where you are meant to be. But people don't tell you that. That's a secret. I'm not charging you for it. That's a secret. <laughs> but it's true. I think it's really true. It yeah. Is. And even if they don't want to be public about it, just to yeah. have the freedom to explore it themselves exactly. and just to really dive into it and say, what's going on? Is this right? Is this wrong? How do I feel about it? Do I agree? Yeah. Mm -hmm. A good point because we're, we're all public. And I, I think that scares people sometimes. You're like, well, I don't want to do this. I'm like, you don't have right. to. <laughs> you don't have to start like a YouTube account exactly. or Instagram to do yes. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, I have a question for the three of you, Laura included. So um, I think maybe we did ask Laura when we interviewed her three years ago. We were one of our first episodes, by the way. <laughs> that, it's been that long. We've been doing this for three consecutive years. And yeah, yeah. I think Laura was I our remember. second episode. Yeah. yeah. Congrats. Congrats. I was traveling at that time too. I was living in Montana, acting like a cowgirl. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I just wanted to ask you, how old were you when you first realized you didn't want to have children? And what is one of the main reasons why you're child-free? Three of you. Oh, I'll go first. Um, I think I knew probably when I was a young teenager, when I wanted to make some extra money and I started babysitting my parents, friends, kids. And while I liked the money, I quickly went, I hate this. I don't really like, I like the kids. I mean, you know, some better than others. I like the kids, but I don't like this parenting kind of a thing. I knew that really like in my gut. Um, so that, that stuck with me. And uh, that's also connected to the main reason as I looked at, as I looked at what I wanted as an adult, I didn't want parenthood to be the central focus of my life. I just did. It was a lifestyle. I just didn't, you know, didn't attract me at all. And thank God I had really pretty cool parents and they just said, Hey, you know, create the life you want. And as long as you're happy, we're happy. Um, you know, that's uh, so that was helpful. 
Um, I didn't get a lot of pressure at home. Mm -hmm. Now, when I did my first book on child-free people and couples, families of two, my mom and I had to get into it a little bit because she didn't want to tell any of her friends that I was doing that book. Oh, wow. Why? Because at the core of it, she felt like she made a, made a, might have parented me uh, not so well because I grew up wanting something she didn't. So I had to we really had to have a heart to heart. And I said, no, you did everything right. <laughs> you sent me the message that I could create the life I want. So that bonded us. But uh, so there were areas where there was acceptance. But then I she also had to accept some feelings about about herself in the process that we remained tighter than ever after that. Wow. Well, yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. I feel that's a whole episode. I want to know about <laughs> that conversation you had because I, I think because you you are the child free expert. You are known. We are like okay, it's Laura. But oh. to to and I, I'm sincere about that. But to hear that you had that experience with your mother because you know I mean I, I did have the support of, from my family, but that's not common. And so mm -hmm. I think it's of comfort to people to know that there you know it wasn't the worst thing, but there like you said there were some words, and I think actually that would be really incredibly helpful to so many people if they knew like just even how you navigated it because you know I think some you know for those of us who are outspoken it can appear like we have no problems <laughs> you know like when it comes to our choice and being accepted for our choice but just to know that there was a bit of a wrinkle at some point that you experience absolutely you know it helps people on their journey wherever they are even if they end up choosing to have kids you know so I think like because I'm I'm also really curious <laughs> I want to know like deep dive into that conversation we'll go to Bettina next but just putting that out there like it's it's a good story to share. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> um, I've been thinking about your question then, and I think I realized that I didn't want uh, children when I was like 15 years old, uh, which was like to me the moment when I had my first uh, like first love <laughs> and first relationship with a boy. Um, and uh, at this moment, so we were in like high school and I I just realized that some people just starting to date others and imagine their life when they will grow up. And most of my friends were like, okay, I will have like one or two children and na, 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 and I'm so in love with this guy. I want to have children with him. <laughs> and, um, and I was the only one thinking, okay, I want to be a journalist or an, I, I wanted to be yeah, a journalist, I think, and travel the world. And I would be the cool aunt uh, coming back with some cool presents from all over the world for my, for my children's friend, uh, friend's children, sorry. And I don't know, it's, it felt so normal at this moment for a few years, because as for you, I never had any pressure from, like, from my family. And they, they quite understood. Actually, when I told my mother that she will never have grandkids, <laughs> uh, she told me I knew it. She, she, she really told me that, of course, I know it. <laughs> because I know that you, this is not for you, it's just not for you. And she was really just not happy or sad about it. She was just, okay, th that's that's just like that. And um, then, uh, yeah, I realized much later that this is, this is it was not something that was supposed to be normal when you're a, a woman. Um, and the reason why I don't want kids, it's the first one will be this one, is just that I never felt a desire to be a mom, never. It's just something that is so, yeah, I, I, I use the word natural because for me, I just, Many people love, love to speak about like the uh, instinct of w women to want and desire a baby, but I have an instinct then <laughs> in my guts that I will never be a mother. <laughs> and of course, then I can add some other things like, because now I am a, f a feminist and I am th um, writing and thinking a lot about the political uh, issues about uh, the patriarchy. So of course, now I could add the fact that as a feminist, I, I'm not saying that it's not feminist to have a child, of course. Uh, I'm just saying that I realized that even today in 2022, it's still a risk when you have a baby to see uh, the inequalities and um, in, your, um, in your home, for example, in your couple, uh, rise when the first baby comes to your family, because then you will more likely quit your job or have a part-time, and then it's uh, you will more likely take care of most more things in your home. And then when you want to go back to your work, uh, you will be devaluated because there was a hole in your uh, resume. And then they will say, oh, but you will not be able to stay late because you have a child and you need to take care of them and many stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, the main reason is just that I, I just don't feel like it and I'm not in interested in being a mother. <laughs> um, yeah, I had... Uh 
definitely my foundational reason is lack of desire like you. So I completely relate to that. But my job journey was, was tumultuous. Um, I, I didn't, I definitely wasn't aware that I had a choice when I was a teenager, even though I wasn't called for this. Um, I think I also like you, Laura, I might've done like two, all my friends were babysitting and making all this money. And I'm like, I'm going to do this thing too. And I did it twice and I hated it. So I, I can relate to that part of the story. Um, but as I got into my twenties, I definitely started to think on my own, not because it was presented as a choice by anyone, but on my own, like this just doesn't feel right for me, but I had zero support and I had tons of pressure from my family and my friends. And I had all the common of you're too young. You're going to change your mind. You're going to regret it. And, um, everything under the sun and, so the the visual that I always look at is like, I felt like I was climbing to the top of the child-free mountain and I would some days be super confident and be like, okay, trekking up to the top. And then something would happen in my life or some comment would made, and then I would be like rolling back down. And then I had to like crawl my way back up. Something would happen in my life and I would fall into a, a hole of doubt or, you know, fear. And so it, it took a very, very long time for me to get to the place where I am right now. And it's interesting because um, I have a relative who, and this just happened two days ago. So it's just, it's just interesting. Um, I had, so I've been having some health issues and, and some, and my symptoms, I have a lot of symptoms, but two of them are, I, I've been having a lot of nausea. I've been vomiting. So there's a lot of stuff going on. And I got some of my initial blood work done and I was talking to this person and my family and, and she was like, Oh, so you're not pregnant? This was two days ago. No, no. I, I promise you. <laughs> oh I promise God. you. And then she looks back at the person who's in the room and and she's like, she's not pregnant. And and I and I I just couldn't even for so many, I was just shocked and not shocked at the same time because one, you know, I'm 46 years old. I made it very clear. I the child-free connection is a huge part of my life now where I talk about being child-free and how to embrace this lifestyle. And here is still two days ago, a family member hoping that I was pregnant, you know, because that's really, they were just so excited about finding out that potentially I went in this direction. And, and I, I don't know why my journey was so complicated, but maybe it was so complicated so that I can help people now because it was not easy for me at all. And I just finally decided on my own that um, I really wanted to spend my finances on just personal development, spiritual growth is really important to me. I wanted to really focus on my health. Uh, I really wanted to, um, I'm very career focused and I wanted, and I know when I'm working on something, I go all in. So I wanted to have the kind of time that I needed to rest and relax and take time for myself and self-care. Um, and lastly, it was really important to me. My parents had uh, a very toxic relationship. So it was very important to me to have a loving, healthy uh, relationship with someone where we can both grow together. And I wanted really, I wanted that to be a focal point. And not that you can't do that with kids, but I feel that this allows me to really dive in. Like, for example, if Rick and I have an issue, we pause, like we have to take care of it. Like we talk about it, what's going on? What do each of us need to do differently? How can we make this better? We're repeating this pattern. I mean, we go to our couple therapist was amazing. Um, we went to her and she, she taught us the skills that we, some skills that we didn't know. So that's all like time and effort and energy and, and, and a financial investment that, I don't know. Again, I'm not going to say someone who has kids can't do, but I just really enjoy having those opportunities and that time to, to grow. On behalf of Child Free Girls, congratulations for not being pregnant. I'll just put that out there. <laughs> <laughs> this is something I never understood that people just still wish you something that you said you don't want. So they basically wish you to be not happy in your life. That's <laughs> completely fucked up right <laughs> and also that the thought didn't cross my own mind like I'm the one nauseous I'm the one vomiting like but it didn't even cross yeah, my mind yeah. you know it wasn't even a thing yeah so wow. it's interesting yeah mm -hmm. 
I had a kind of a follow-up question for Veronica, and that's, you know, you said that you were going confidently up the child free hill and then every now and then something would happen that would make you fall back down. I'm just wondering what kind of thing would make you um, have such a hard time trusting your instincts and what you wanted. Whew, there were so many things. I mean, I, when you're in your 20s, like someone's comments can really affect you to your core. They no longer do at all for me. Um, and it's not that I respect or um, I'm not validating what someone's trying to tell me, but it's not going to break me apart. Right. Um, so a simple comment could just tear me down, you know, like you're going, you know, what, you know, if someone, if a mother really told me like, I'm going to miss out on all these things on all these like snapshot moments, I'm not going to have a kid look into my eyes and tell me that they love me. You know, I'm not going to have, um, the opportunity to see them glow, you know, grow and flourish and things like that. And I didn't understand at the time that there is some grief to the process because even though I knew there was a lack of desire and I knew that I didn't want to be a mom, there is some letting go of, I'm never going to have those experiences. And it, and it's confusing when you're younger because it makes you feel like, well, maybe I want those experiences if I'm feeling ambivalent about them, but that wasn't it at all. It was just like, I needed to understand that that was okay, that I'm never going to have that. And it's fine. Um, so that's definitely something that I had to, that I had to learn. And also speaking about my child-free choice was really hard for me when I was younger. Um, it's, it's easy for me now, but on, honestly, I really only started talking about it when I launched the Child Free Connection. Before that, I was pretty quiet about it. Even my family and my friends who have watched our YouTube videos or are on an Instagram, they're like, we didn't even have idea, any idea that you were struggling because I, I tend to internalize everything, not just this topic, but I internalize everything. Like nobody ever knows something's wrong with me because I always just handle everything on my own in my head. And um, so it was... It was anything from like little things. Like I would go get my hair done and someone would say like, I can't wait to see what your kid's hair is going to look like because it's going to be full and gorgeous and blah, 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 you know, and I'd be like, well, I'm not having any. And then they would be like, how could you not? Like, you know, and I was just always, I don't know what it is with my energy because I do know that some people never had to deal with any of this. But again, I was at the pool last week and this family with children with their babies like came over and they're like, do you have kids? I don't know. And my friends were with me and they're like, that never happens to me. And I'm like, I don't know why I'm a magnet for people wanting me to have children. I don't know why, but something is going on. Um, so yeah, so it was hard. So just, it was the comments. It was all the pressure. It was self-doubt, but I also think it was a lack of confidence of when you're younger because you're doubting your choices and your decisions because you're really just starting to develop of why am I making this choice and why am I really standing behind it? So it just got very confusing to me. I'm going to pick up on just quickly the, um, the what you mentioned, Veronica, that the fear of missing out, I'm not going to have this experience. I can't tell you how many women I've talked to over the years where they know this is the childhood choice is right for them, but they feel this way. And where conversations have gone is a level deeper. It's like, well, what is, okay, with not seeing the love of, you know, that you're in your child's eyes, for example, what, what emotional experience are we really looking for? Mm -hmm. Is it really, does it have to be the child's eyes? Does it have to, you know, to, to begin to broaden to say, well, what, what is the bigger emotional thing that I'm, I'm driving at? And, 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 you know, many times, if not always, there are other ways to get that deeper emotional experience. Our society tells us it's parenthood, motherhood, but really when it gets right down to it, it requires a little more soul searching on how else could I get that? And I'll tell you, child-free people do. It's just getting clear about what those things are, what meaning means to you and finding those experiences out there. And they can look a variety of different ways. So it's, you know, you're not alone <laughs> in what you're experiencing. I can tell you that. Yeah, absolutely. that wouldn't even be a thing. I mean, it's, it's so perpetuated in movies where like, it's just this like, the sunlit glittery moment when your child, you know, touches you or hugs. I mean, they really emphasize how special this is supposed to be. And if that weren't pounded into us all the time, we wouldn't even, it's the same complaint people have about romantic movies or, or like mm -hmm. romantic comedies or whatever. Like, well, this just sets us up to think that we're going to find true love, whatever that is, and that you need true love to be happy. So, you know, you have to look at how much, how much of the influence is, is just something we're just being bombarded with every day. 
Right. And is it even really that special? Yeah. And also, <laughs> accept, and also just accept the fact that fulfillment comes in package in so many different ways and that right. it's okay if we're fulfilled by children or if we're not, we can be fulfilled right. by our careers, by our hobbies, by the people that we surround ourselves with. And once you become really clear on that, um, all that starts to melt away for sure. I wanted to add because I'm currently working on my next uh, book, uh, which is about the child free characters in the US uh, TV shows. And um, I'm also writing a chapter about how we feature uh, motherhood in these TV shows. And most of the time, which is completely, I, I don't understand, um, most of the pregnancies are not planned. So it's always like a surprise and like, oh, we didn't plan it and just it's coming. And there is no, never a reflect a time for the couple or the, the, the woman to think really about it. It's just coming like that. And it's some like a way of, just saying that you don't need to think about it because every woman wants a baby and just that's it. And about the Chakri character, it's really interesting because they are featured as evil or really it's the anti-heroine uh, that just um, is so uh, superficial or is always having sex with so many men or is having a so giant, like huge career that she's really too egoist to have a baby or something like that. And I, I can't wait to write about it uh, and publish it because I think it's not something just about the movies. It's something that is saying a lot about our society and the way that we are seeing uh, child-free uh, women and the way that we just don't want to speak about the reality of motherhood as well. So we just wanted to add that. <laughs> I really noticed lately, and I'm sure all of you have too, that the the media and the press, there's been such an uptick in child-free movement and people wanting to be child-free and, and studies being done and how the percentages of the numbers are going up. And I really realized that in, it's making some people, at least in our audience that they're sharing with us, is that it's making them feel like, okay, now it's more accepted or it's you can read about it more, you can see about it more. But although the movement is growing and maybe to an extent there's acceptance in some communities, it doesn't mean that you're not going to feel all the things, right? You're not going to feel the potential shame, the pressure, the judgment, like all those emotions, regardless of how popular child-free movement gets, those are still present. You know, I think about um, if you're, you know, when I was a kid, mental health was not a huge discussion. If any, you know, I used to be depressed as a kid, like it just wasn't paid attention to anxiety, wasn't paid attention to. And then over the past few decades, it's changed. And we're so aware of the importance of mental health, but it doesn't mean that people aren't suffering, right? So so I just want women to know that even that it's be, even though it's becoming potentially more accepted in some areas or it's being talked about more, that they're if they're still feeling this way, it's still completely valid. And just one last thing. So I am, for the past year, I worked on a program. It's called the Ultimate Guide to Embracing a Child-Free Life. And the it's the waiting list is up on the childfreeconnection.com. But the easiest way I can describe it is I I worked in a way, how can I help women get to the top of that mountain without crawling up the way that I did mm -hmm. and handing them a lift ticket? Mm -hmm. Because I don't believe that anybody should go through the very hard journey that I went to. And I just wanted to acknowledge those women because I think that people are again, seeing that, oh, this is a, this is fine now. So if I'm feeling less than, or if I'm feeling bad, then that's making me weird. So just wanted to clarify that for them. Well, thank you, ladies. Um, so before we wrap up completely the episode, I would like uh, each of you to please send out a message to our audience, anything you want to tell them, and also to plug in your social media website, where can they find you so they can, you know, go and follow you. Oh, well, I think the last thing I want to circle back just to the um, to International Child Free Day and kind of what it's about, and it, it really is about to create awareness of the child free choice globally. And so, to anybody who's out there watching right now, if you want help in trying to spread this word in your communities, um, please feel free to find me and child, International Child Free Days on Facebook. It's on Twitter, direct message. Either I or someone will be in touch with you. Um, so it's to uh, don't be afraid to begin to talk about it in your in your own area. So, um, so the goal still is to, you know, make it so that, you know, next year more people in France know about it. <laughs> or, and, you know, and we have seen more of this uh, as we've been going on, but the world's a big place. So uh, we got to keep more people talking about it. So, and I just also want to close by saying, having been at this over 20 years, when I look at the women in this Zoom call, I go, 
All right, progress is happening. So, you know, there's lots of problems, things to talk about from somebody who's kind of played the long game. I look at just what's out here in this microcosm here today. It's like, it's it's all moving in the, in the right direction. So keep it up, you guys, you guys rock. So thank you, rock all of you. Yeah. We appreciate that. Also, when is International Child for Day? I realized I didn't even set that up at the beginning of this conversation. August 1st, every year. <laughs> it's our anniversary as well. Did you oh, know that? Yeah, that's right. we, no way. Funny, funny story. We were so busy celebrating International Child Free Day this year that we forgot it was our podcast, our third year podcast anniversary. Wow. And we're like, we're in a relationship. Like we're in it for the long haul too. Like we, we totally forgot. So I'm, I still have to send them our, uh, my gift to those two, but yeah. Um, you know, we, we, and, and just again, thank you, Laura, for everything. Cause you, you know, you embraced our podcast right out the gate and, you know, we, we've got a long way to go in the long game, but you know, we're, we're dedicated, <laughs> um, yeah. but we do appreciate, and, and again, I'm just going to speak on behalf of anyone that may count as you. Thank you for embracing child-free people and content creators, because it's hard. All of us can attest to how challenging it is. Sorry, uh, landscapers. Uh, it's <laughs> challenging to get um, started. It's challenging to keep the momentum going. We all hit walls. And so, you know, we all see you and respect you as someone who has, you know, we recognize you have been in this game a long time and not every Everyone is receptive to new people. So, you know, it's really, it, it means a lot that you support new content creators, whether they stick around or whether, you know, it's, it's, it's a short period of time that they're active, but I, I just have to say it's, it's valued. And thank you so much just for supporting all of us. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. Well, it's, it's the way to create the social changes. you got to mentor and get more people and expose it to more people. And as I say, now I'm, I'm going to, I'm the older generation now. So I'm, you know, I want to empower your generation and younger generations so that they, they can speak out even earlier in their lives and get it even earlier. So that, that's the game. The game is a, a big game, long game. And it's a lot of, a lot of people have to be, be in on it. That's, I don't know how to finish that but <laughs> after what you said. <laughs> um, no, I would just add that uh, there is no good or bad reason or even no necessary reason not to want children because most of the time I realized when you say you don't want children when I am interviewed by people who are not child free or just meet new people who are not child free they just ask why <laughs> but with a like not a friendly tone so I just want to remember to remind that that if you have like dozens of reasons that's great but you can just say ah, I don't know it's just like that because it is valid anyway and to remind that um, we are normal it's not obviously linked to a pathology or uh, I don't know something that we should deal with a trauma that we had in our childhood or anything like that it can but most mo some people have children when they had trauma in, in their childhood and some people just don't and um, yeah uh, I think that's really great to have this kind of places where we can talk together about uh, diverse uh, vision and experiences and and as you said Laura I hope it it will continue to change and that we'll have more and more people just speaking out loud about this and what i owe personally is that my instagram account will be uh, useless in five or ten years because there will be nothing else to speak about <laughs> yes, exactly. hey wait yeah. i i kind of agree with that but at the same time no because this is a lot of fun yeah. <laughs> yes also. you know like we want progress but not too much progress because we, we 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 need something to do come on well if i know you lenora you'll, you'll sure. create something oh, that's really I will. amazing i will yeah. you'll, I'll you'll figure it into out. the next phase lenora for sure i just want to say patina do you want to send a message in french to our French speakers, oh. uh, French speaking audience, please. Allez. <laughs> euh, ben oui, que c'est. Je vais faire la même chose. Je vais traduire. Alors, du coup, c'est que vous êtes valide et normal et qu'il n'y a pas de mauvaise ou de bonne raison de vouloir ou non des enfants. Euh, tous les choix de vie sont valides et le plus important, c'est d'avoir l'occasion de réfléchir à ce qu'on veut euh, dans la vie pour soi-même. Oui. And here it is. <laughs> oui. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> so we can find you in at je ne veux pas d'enfants. Yes, uh, on Instagram, I have also a TikTok account, but I don't use it that much because I feel a bit old. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm on there, don't worry, it's fine, totally fine, do it, do it, do it. Please. I just don't understand all of the features, but that's fine. It's okay, and do it anyway. Yes. <laughs> and I have a, um, a blog where I just post sometimes, so it's my full name, Bettina Zorli dot fr, French, for French. <laughs> um, I, I think what I really want to say is that the child-free spectrum to me and 
just from speaking to our audience and all the micro my, uh, market research I've done, it's so wide, right? Because some of us knew from the time we were two, we didn't have kids. Some people don't like kids at all. Some people really like them. Some people are maternal. And it's just so uh, by obviously by choice, by circumstance. And I feel that it's really important for, for everyone out there to respect wherever people are in their journey and wherever they come from, because I just don't want any kind of divisiveness to happen within our community because we have so much work to do. And the only way that we're really going to push this forward is by being a united front. So I think it's really important to understand each other's personal journeys. And one is not better than the other. They're just very different. Um, and I think that's just something that I've been thinking about as well. And that I think is really important to help us with all the hard work that we have to do and uh, and really to have a lot of respect for one another. And um, you can find me at the thechopperconnection.com really has everything, but we're on Instagram. We have a YouTube channel. I don't spend that much time on Twitter and Facebook um, or TikTok just because obviously it's overwhelming, but I was also out. My day job is um, I'm a social media consultant and I really believe on just focusing on minimal amount of platforms, if not just one. So sometimes we tend to do it all and spread spread ourselves to thin and we burn out that way. So it's it's good if if you don't have, if whoever is listening in an audience doesn't have a million accounts, it's fine. Just do one and start there and get comfortable with that. And if it makes sense to you to go to another one, do that. But yeah, right now we're mostly active on Instagram and YouTube and uh yeah, I'm excited for people to come and check us out. Awesome. Well, and congratulations to both of you again. And, and Rick, who's here on in spirit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Rick. Exactly. Yeah. And Rick Ward, uh, child free person and child free group of the year. Uh, and thanks again, Laura, for being in this space with us with the winners of this year. We're very, very happy and very, we were very excited to have you here. So thank you. It was great to be here. And thank you for having us on. Really, really excited that you're winners this year. So really. <laughs> thank you. So that was all for this episode. Thank you so much for sticking with us up until the end. You can find us at childfreegirls.com. Our email is childfreegirls at gmail.com. You can send us comments, questions, suggestions for episodes. And we do have posts on our blog, uh, Dear Child Free Girls. So if you have any thing happening in your child free life that you want input in, not necessarily advice, but input, you can send us an email with the subject, your child for girls question. It can be anonymous and you're going to get three answers because Lenora, Kristen and I answer separately. And we never agree. <laughs> we never agree. That's not true. That's, that's not true. Well, see, <laughs> right there. Of course, you can find us all over social media. We are at child for girls on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, of course. <laughs> you can find our book, Child for Girls Comfort Food for Thought, available on Amazon in paperback and on Kindle. And of course, you can leave us a five star review on our podcast if you're watching or listening to this on Spotify or Apple. And of course, if you're subscribing to our YouTube, or please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, all comments are welcome below. Subscribe button. And yeah, that's for it for social media. And our question for you today is what did you learn having listened to this episode? You know, you heard about being child free in Texas, being child free in French speaking areas or specifically France. And Laura Carroll also had quite a few things to say about her experience. So just what did you what did you learn from listening to this conversation today? And you can leave it in the comments below. If it was something very private or personal, you can send it to us in an email. Don't forget to tune in in a couple of weeks for our newest episode. Bye. 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 Bye.